So in our gospel today, this leper approaches Jesus and uses an expression which I think many of us can relate to, uh, to some degree. Uh, he says to him, if you want to, you can cure me. If you want to, you can cure me. So let's try and uh, understand that the circumstances, the, the picture that we see here. So Jesus is surrounded by a large crowd. Okay? It says at the beginning, after Jesus had come down from the mountain, large crowds followed him. Okay, so it's a large crowd of people. Now, a leper approaches. Now, again, we, we hear these kind of stories, and maybe we've seen them uh, enacted in, in primary school plays or something like that, where and it's all kind of harmless and nice. But back in the day, if a leper approached, it was like a, a modern-day person having something like Ebola. You know, people would have been scared to death to come within 10 paces of a leper because it was contagious and incurable. So they would have been scared. Even You can imagine, you know, Peter, the apostles, trying to protect Jesus. Jesus, stand back. We'll take care of this. You know what I mean? We don't want you getting infected with leprosy. So as this leper would have approached the crowd, Peter would have screamed. Peter would have shouted all sorts of go-aways at him uh, in no uncertain terms. Maybe some might have even picked up rocks. You know? So there would have been, there would have been a, bit of a, a bit of a storm now as this leper approaches, kind of in a way with nothing to lose because he has a death sentence anyway. He's going to die of this disease slowly and painfully. So he approaches the crowd. So we can imagine this, 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 this storm of, of anger and, uh, and fear uh, and just an, an awful environment. The, 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 the environment suddenly changes from Jesus preaching and teaching about lost sheep and figs and all these wonderful things that Jesus used to speak about. And then suddenly the atmosphere would have changed very, very quickly. So this, le this leper approaches. And he says, if you want to, you can cure me. Now, in, in our prayer, we often ask for things which is good. It's good that we ask for, for everything that we need. It's good that we trust the Lord with the, 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 the big questions of our life. You know, who am I to marry? What's my vocation? Uh, what college course should I do? Uh, what's the next step in my life? It's good that we ask these questions. It's good also that we entrust to the Lord the little things. Lord, my, you know, my finances, my, Lord, I need a parking space. I'm wicked late. I need to get in, get the chicken and get home. You know, even ridiculous things like that. To ask, Lord, can I just get a spot there uh, near, the, near the, the entrance to the shop? It would be great. Uh, and, you know, so it's good to trust the Lord, even with the small things. Good. But at times, the, the, there are things that we ask for, and we don't really know how it's going to work out. If you're praying for someone who's sick, if you're praying for someone who's been diagnosed with cancer, you know, like... Whatever about any uh, epidemics going on, a third of people we know will die of cancer. A third of them. That's they're, they're huge, huge numbers will, will die to cancer. So when we're praying for people, we know that eventually our lives have to end at some point anyway. That we do eventually have to go. So we, we come to the Lord with, with these prayers of trust, and yet not really knowing how it's going to work out. We don't have control in this situation. So we say to the Lord, Lord, if you want to, you can cure me. And Jesus' answer is just, it's so beautiful, right? Because we're trying to get to know the Lord's heart and all these gospels and in scripture in general, we should be trying to get to, to know the Lord. the Lord. This is divine revelation, God who reveals himself. So what does this reveal about Jesus? He says, of course I want to be cured. Of course, I want to. Now, we, we, we know from experience, not every prayer that we make will be granted because it, it can't be. You know, if there's one farmer over there, he's got hay down, right? He needs dry weather. There's one farmer who has just cut the silage and spread manure. He needs rain, okay? Now, if they're both praying, <laughs> what's going to happen? I mean, I don't know how the Lord is supposed to work this one out. Uh, but, so... It's not always going to be that, that I ask for something and I get it immediately. It, like, it, it, prayer doesn't work like that. It's not mechanical. Because ultimately, the prayers will be granted that lead us towards heaven. Prayers will be granted that lead us towards heaven. And prayers that w intentions that might lead us away from him will not be granted and should not be granted. Why would the Lord give us enough rope to hang ourselves pardon the, the, the expression but why would he give us enough, enough uh, uh, ability or, gr or, or, or wealth to actually risk our souls why would he do that that's completely lost sight of the big picture which is heaven so God will give us whatever is good 
good for us, whatever, whatever will help us get to heaven. But he always wants to give. Sometimes, you know, you can see with children as well, I mean, this is a tendency I often have as well, you know, when I'm playing with my nieces and nephews, I want them to have fun, and I always kind of push the boundaries of maybe, you know, of course we can have 17 of us on the bouncy castle, sure, what could possibly go wrong? <laughs> you know, Ave, hey, come in everybody, it'd be great fun. Uh, you know, you want, to, you want everyone to have fun, you want everyone to, you know, swing out of trees, and okay, I know you're four years of age, you'll be fine. <laughs> you know, so you want people to, to enjoy life, but yet... Uh, maybe now is not the time. You know, so God, God wants what's good for us. So just maybe now isn't the time. Maybe we're not ready for that grace yet. So God always wants what's good for us, but can't necessarily give it to us unless we're ready. Unless we're ready. If you want to, you can cure me. Of course, I want to be cured. Something which I I, I love about this gospel as well is the the leper has such humility. He's not saying, God, you did this to me, now you take it away. Okay, he's not accusing God of anything. He approaches God with humble faith. And humble faith sees the miracle. Humble faith witnesses the miracle. Humble faith sees the miracle. We see something similar with, with Abraham, or Abra- Abraham and, uh, and Sarah, Sarai, Sarah, Sarai who becomes Sarah. Uh, so we, we see a similar thing. Humble faith sees a miracle. I mean, he was 99, she was 90. I um, don't know how good your biology is, but uh, you tend not to have children at that age. Uh, so Abraham actually laughs. I mean, this, this, this is impossible. <laughs> like, this is medically impossible. Uh, and so he laughs. And, and God says, no, you, Sarah will have a son. And from her will issue a whole uh, line of kings, a whole uh, generations, which will belong to me, and you will be a blessing. So humble faith witnesses the miracle. Humble faith witnesses the miracle. A little side note, the whole um, idea of of circumcision. Uh, the church, I don't think, doesn't have a, a clear teaching on why that became the sign of the covenant, because it's, it's rather unusual. Um, but, you know, one would imagine uh, maybe a mark in the back of the hand or an earring or a nose ring or eyebrow ring or something would have been, uh, or a finger ring would have been sufficient mark of the, uh, the covenant. Uh, but I think the, the idea is, the, the one possible explanation is this. Uh, now, this is my covenant which you are to maintain between, between myself and you, you and your descendants after you, all your males must be circumcised. You and your descendants. So it's, I think the, 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 uh, that sign of the covenant is linked to the fact that uh, this covenant is made with Abraham and the generation. So in the generation of further generations, that's when the sign becomes visible, if you will. So that's how it's, it's passed on. This, this, this covenant is made with the generations, the next generation uh, uh, of people. So Abraham's children and his children's children and so on. So I think that's, that's why uh, that's the particular sign of the covenant there. But back to our theme, humble faith sees the miracle. This is a bit of a can of worms to get into, but I think it's, it's an important one. Humble faith sees the miracle. I think there's... I was talking to a lady from England yesterday and uh, she was speaking about the difficulties in her own diocese and in her own parish uh, about priest numbers. You know, the numbers of priests. There aren't, enough, there aren't sufficient vocations, so many churches now have a mass every second or third weekend. Uh, and many of the priests are aged, many of them are gone well beyond retirement age, but still, still serving. And she said, you know, we must, we must pray for, for more priests. And I said, absolutely agree, and so on. I was sent an article then further, well, later on, later on uh, in the afternoon, about uh, someone who's absolutely convinced that the way forward is, is women's ordination. And I couldn't help but think, you see, okay, we've got, we've got, we've got a little bit of an issue here. Uh, some would say in the church, the way forward is compromise. If we, if we make compromise... Okay, so people disagree with us. There's teachings of the church, and there's people who disagree. If we make compromise, then we welcome people in. So the more we compromise, uh, the healthier the church gets, because people will then, will then see the church as, as relevant and will come back. Okay? Um, 
This is a very, very risky play <laughs> because if we're wrong, we end up with a compromised church. So a church doesn't actually stand for anything or doesn't stand for much or stands for the easy things. You know, it's easy to stand for uh, protection of the environment and, and so on, you know, helping the poor and those kind of social justice issues. They're not difficult. No one's going to oppose you. Uh, if we think of just compromise for one second, this idea, the, the word compromise. Imagine you have you've a child and you go in, you do your shopping in Tesco's, you come out and there is little Johnny, your son, right, with two Mars bars in his hand that you didn't pay for. And neither did he, because he's six. Okay, so you say, sorry, where did you, where did you get the Mars bars? He says, well, I got them in the shop. Did you pay for them? No, but they were just there. Yes, uh, but you can't, you see, you can't, you can't take things from shops without paying for them. That's called stealing. But I like Mars bars. Yes, I understand, but you have to pay for them. If you want them, you can't just take things. So you can imagine him trying to work out what's happening here. I'm, I'm allowed to do this at home. I'm not allowed to do this in a shop. So I'm not allowed to take things. And so he's, what if you were to say, look, okay, you've got two Mars bars there. What about, let's compromise, okay? If you have to steal, just steal one. Okay? Is that okay? Okay. <laughs> no, you see, you would never make a compromise there. What if, you know, a, you're driving 100 kilometers an hour in front of a school, 30 zone, and you get stopped by the police. Uh, and you say, look, I'm sorry, I'm just, I'm, the pizza's getting cold. I just ha I have, to, I have to get back. I have to get back home. There's people waiting for the food. And the guard says to you, okay, let's, let's, let's go 50-50 let's go on this, right? Let's just say you were doing 60. Instead of, you know, I mean, I'll give you a, I won't take your license. No, see, you don't make a compromise that you can't. What if, you, if your husband is being unfaithful and you've worked out that he's unfaithful in or around four times a month? And you say, look, Honey, would you mind? This is compromise, okay? I don't want you to be unfaithful. You want to be unfaithful. Could you be unfaithful half as often as you are? So maybe twice a month. See, this is, when we apply compromise to moral things, it's absolute insanity. It's, 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 it's ridiculous. It's, it's, it's actually humorous. You know what I mean? To make a compromise in moral things. It's just, either if something is wrong, doing it less often, while it's an improvement, it's still not right. So you can never endorse it. You can never say it's okay to do something wrong less often than you were doing it. While, as I say, it is an improvement, step in the right direction, but you can never say it's the right thing to do, to do something wrong less often. So in, in, in the church, when it comes to, to what the church teaches, when it comes to what the Lord has given us, it is never right to think that we have a better idea. Never. And 2,000 years later, to think that we have a better idea than the Lord in how he sets up the church and who he ordains, that's just insanity. It's crazy, and I guarantee you that that idea never, ever, ever comes from kneeling down in front of the Blessed Sacrament, that you will come out of a, an adoration chapel thinking, I have it now, we should ordain women. That will never happen, never, because the Lord will never con contradict himself. So if it's not the Lord who's inspiring this, well then there's only, on, only one other source for this idea. It's not God. It's not God. It's not coming from him. You know, and this kind of moral compromise will not work has never worked and will bear no fruit. Other churches have tried it. Do, do the research. It has never worked. And it never should work. It never deserves to work. Why would the Lord bless the church for doing something that he hasn't asked it to do? It won't work. This is not humble faith seeing the miracle. This is arrogance. And the only thing that will come from that is desolation, like that there will be fewer and fewer people in the church. The guarantee it will not work, will not work. So if we push this and we're wrong, imagine like, imagine what will happen. It'll take 20, 30 years to recognize, whoops. In that point, the church then is so irrelevant. Look at France. So many young people growing up who know very, very, like they, they were the sister church of, of Rome for so long. And now so many young people have no idea what Christians even believe the vaguest ideas of who Jesus is. You know, in 60, 70 years less, it's, the faith has been absolutely annihilated in so many places. So there's, there is no blessing, none at all, in compromise when it comes to what the church teaches or, or when it comes to morality. It's just, it's just crazy. It will bear no fruit. It cannot. It should not. On the other hand, we may find ourselves as a, a church somewhat weakened, like the leper. So if we want to see the miracle in the church, then we must approach the Lord 
as the leper did, with humility and with faith. And then we will see the miracle. We don't tell the Lord what to do. We don't blame him. And we don't tell him that we know better. Because that's just, who do we think we are? Lord, if you want to, you can cure me. Of course I want to. Be cured. And his leprosy was cured at once. Lord, we ask you to, to heal us today and to heal our church, to heal its brokenness, to heal this desire to, to compromise in your teaching. We ask you, Lord, to grant us a new heart, a new spirit, and a new life. Amen.